A very good and joyous morning it is indeed for each and every one, myself included, to be with you today to worship our Lord and to magnify Him and uh, hear His Word and sing psalms of adoration to His Son, Jesus Christ, indeed because He is worthy, and Jesus is worthy in that He died on the cross and He rose from the dead and He's coming back again to rescue a people such as us who are faithful and hopeful and exhibiting His redemption through living out each and every day faith, hope, and love. And the best way in which we do that is by relying upon His Word, meditating upon His Word, so that on the day of His return we shall be found faithful. And the word that we have this morning is in 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. Remember that John is addressing false teachers who falsely confined sin to mere unbelief. Predictably, the outcome is disastrous. If that's the case, then sexual immorality is not a sin. Hating your brother is not a sin. Selfishness is not a sin. Adultery is not a sin. Murder is not a sin because sin is only a matter of unbelief. Sin, however, John contends, is not mere intellectual assent, but it's also volitional obedience. Indeed, John would proceed to remind the church that sin is, at its core, demonic. When we sin, we are behaving like Satan, because Satan has been sinning from the very beginning. Like Satan, we are thrown down from God's presence for our sin, where we die. For this reason, John told us in the previous section, Jesus came down from heaven to earth for the express purpose of destroying the work of Satan which is sin resulting in death. Those now who belong to Jesus have been born again as the children of God. And as newborns in the faith, Christians grow, right? We are born again, new birth. We have a lot of new parents here in a separate room. Thank God for Brother Noel and his ministry with a video camera set up there so that they can join us in worship. And their children would not uh, disturb us. But children grow. And how do Christians grow? From new birth to maturity. Well, John tells us that the mark of growth of maturity in every Christian is sinning less and less and less and less. To the point that when Jesus returns, you're not only sinning less, but you can no longer now sin. You cannot sin. Which is then the title to this morning's sermon is, He, the one who is born of God, whose seed remains in the one who trusts in Jesus, he cannot sin. John explicates the process of sinning less and less through the metaphor of newborn life. So think of a baby. Think of conception, right? As Christians, we contend that life begins where? At conception. Life begins at conception. That's why we're against abortion. And we have such a picture today. At the initial stage of our spiritual life, the seed, the word here literally in Greek is sperma. The seed, it conceives. And it gives birth to life. And it shows progress of growth by beginning to sin less and less. At the final stage of life, Jesus appears. God's presence is now given in full measure, no, no longer partially. And at that point, the born-again children of God can no longer sin. Which, of course, stands in sharp contrast to the false teachers that we have encountered in John's letter who minimize sin as mere unbelief. For John then, ironically, ironically, the death of sin begins at the new life of a Christian. The death of sin begins at the new birth of a believer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, Everyone having been born of God does not sin. Because his sperma, 
God's seed remains in him. Now the sperma here means Jesus as the seed of God. There might be some evidence for that because Paul says Jesus is the true seed of Abraham. But that's not the same as saying Jesus is the seed of God, the sperma of God. Some would say that the sperma here is the child of God. Or it could literally mean, quite crudely, the life-giving agent as a sperm conceives. And I think that's the point. It's to highlight the moment of conception of a new born-again life for a believer. At that moment, when you're born again, when you had faith, sin began to die. That's the point I think that John is trying to make. Being born again then negates or cancels the enterprise of sinning altogether. Indeed, new birth is a requirement to enter the kingdom of God because God's kingdom has zero tolerance for sin. And Jesus declares this in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered Nicodemus, saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because the kingdom of God does not tolerate sin. And for you to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. There's no exception to the rule of such entrance. To be clear, Jesus clarifies to Nicodemus what being born again is not. It does not mean entering your mother's womb a second time. In verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You have your physical birthday, September 22, 1977. That's my born of the flesh. In the small island of Ramlon in the Philippines. My parents tell me, no running water, no electricity. It's a candle in a room. Born. Born in the flesh. But there's another kind of birth. That is, born of the Spirit. And do not marvel that I said this to you. That you must be born the second time. A spiritual birth. And this birth is given by the Spirit of God. The Ruach, the breath of God. The wind in the book of Genesis, at the beginning of creation, that was hovering over the face of the earth. The exact breath of God that breathed life into clay and Adam emerged. That's the Spirit of God. The life-giving agent of God. He, God's Spirit, gives life. Conception through the Spirit. Not unlike Jesus, right? He was conceived by the Spirit. And so are we conceived by the Spirit on that fateful day. Perhaps you went to church. Perhaps you encountered someone. Perhaps you were in a bedroom, one of my best friends in college, he was in a prison cell, selling drugs. Even though his dad is the CFO of Chick-fil-A, they're multimillionaires. He was rebellious. He had a golf scholarship to Auburn University. He was, he was selling drugs. He got caught. He went to prison. There's nothing in the prison except one of his dad's friends, came by and gave him a Bible. And in that prison cell, nothing to do, he began to read. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The Word of Christ. And in that prison cell, the Spirit, through the preaching, the reading of the Word, gave life. And he was born again. Spiritual life then begins at the conception 
when the Holy Spirit enters, invades our life. In John chapter 1, verse 12, But to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become what? The children of God. The reception of Jesus gives you the right to become God's child. And we became God's children not because of blood, right? We learned that last Sunday, why God did not deliver Israel from captivity to sin, but only captivity to Egypt, so that no one can say, God saved me because I'm a Jew. No, it's God's doings, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. It's not even your choice that you became born again. But it is God's choice, but of God. We can't make ourselves become born again. We don't decide when or how we get to be born again. God decides the new birth. Nothing less than God's sovereign election determines our new birth. And Jesus then explains this to Nicodemus. That Nicodemus, you just can't decide when or how to become born again. By employing the metaphor of a wind. In chapter 3, verse 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, right? If you're a hip-hop fan, you know that this is now a very a popular item from Kanye's clothing, right? Ye must be born again. Right? Ye, because Yeezy, he has a shirt like that. Ye must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think the metaphor is pretty easy to understand, right? We don't control the wind. We don't tell the wind, go here, go there. You guys understand? Right? The wind decides where the wind blows. We don't. We're at the mercy of the decision of the wind. Hurricanes. Storms, waves, the wind decides. We don't. Hurricane Katrina, the biggest natural disaster in America, the wind decides. We don't. And so it is with being born again. God decides. We don't. Do not marvel that I'm saying to you, praise Church West Covina, you must be born again. The Spirit must come and invade your life and turn your heart of stone into heart of flesh so that you can sing amazing grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. That's why it's grace. Because I could not make myself see. God gave me eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to perceive. Moreover, God's Spirit is embodied in His Word so that the seed can interchangeably interchangeably mean both the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Because God's presence is embodied in His Word. We see this in the Genesis story of Abraham. Every time God shows up, what does God do? It is always His Word. And it it is always at the right time when Abraham is about to sin again. God shows up with His Word. And at that moment God's Word shows up, Abraham straightens up. He gets back on the path of faith. And that's the story of the Christian life. God's Word shows up. That's why we got to go to church. Amen. Because we need the Word of God. Because His Word grants faith. We don't decide faith. We don't manufacture faith. We can't tell ourselves, Joel, come on, have more faith. God does that. When and how does God do that? Through His Word. Through His Word. James says this as much in James chapter 1, verse 18. He chose to give birth to us 
to give us birth. How? Through the word of truth. It's by his word. Peter agrees with James on this particular point. In chapter 1, verse 23, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not the exact same word of sperma, but a similar word. It's within the, the, what they call the lexical domain of seed, right? Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living and abiding word of God. How, how are you born again? By the living and abiding word of God. God's word is the life-producing agent. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, So then, pray church Muscovina, faith does not come, does not come when you're emotional. Faith does not come when you're just by yourself and you're just thinking about life. Because that's what Muhammad claims, right? That's, that's what Joseph Smith claims. They had an epiphany. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. It's through the word. The same word that grants faith is the same word that created the universe in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, His word. So how does God give life? Through His spirit, through His ruach, His breath. And also through His word, because both are interchangeable. So as a church, we can be spirit-led and be doctrinally sound. And they, can, and they can be working in tandem. Often people think, oh, they're just a Bible-believing church. There's no spirit there. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. No. In a church where they preach the Word of God is where the Spirit of God is most prevalent and moving. And God said, His Word, let there be light. And then there was light. The moment we have faith, having now been born again, is the moment then sin begins to die. Sin begins to die when God gives us new life. Once again, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, everyone having been born of God does not sin. Why? Because his sperma God gave life to us. And at that moment, you do not sin. John maintains the incompatibility between being born again and sinning. In chapter 5, verse 18, we know that no one who is born of God sins. Do we know this? We know, John knows, I don't know if Praise Church West Covina knows. We know that no one born again sins. But he who was born of God keeps him. And the evil does not touch him. Born again is the entrance of God's Spirit, His presence in our lives. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 6, no one who abides in God, in His presence, His Spirit, sins. No one who has seen Him sins or knows Him. So notice the parallel there. Abiding in God is the same as being born again. Having His Spirit in our lives. That is why we stop sinning, because God's presence is now here. Now here's the kicker. We only have God's presence partially now. We don't have God's presence in full measure until 
the return of Jesus. That's why there are commands in the Bible, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. We are like an internal combustion engine vehicle. We need gas. Or you can also be a Tesla. You need to charge. And how do we get charged up? His Spirit. His Word. Because the more we have of His Word, the less we sin. And that's the relationship. There's an inverse relationship between having God's Word, having God's Spirit, and sin. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Here's the principle. If you have more of God's presence, more of God's Word, then the inverse happens. You have less of sin. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So how then do we keep the commandments of God? By our willpower? No, by abiding in God's presence. So there's a sense of oughtness. Yes, we are in God's presence, but we don't have the fullness of God's presence yet. That's why He says in chapter 2, verse 6, you ought to, you ought to walk in the same way in which you walk, implying that we're not doing that fully yet. So you ought to do this. And how do you do that? By abiding, by having more of God's presence. Now, till the time we have the full measure of God's presence, Paul lays out the principle against sin. And the more we, of, of God's presence we get, the more of the Holy Spirit, the more full we have of God's, spirit, of God's presence, the less sin we commit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Here's the principle. But I say, praise Church West Covina, walk by the Spirit. In order that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now what is the works, the works of the flesh? It is this. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, drunkenness, selfishness, bitterness, covetousness. Those are works of the flesh. How do we overcome those things? The Spirit of God. It's not self-help. It's not positive thinking. It's not... Looking at life with glass half full instead of half empty. No. Sin is a spiritual battle. Sin is demonic. You don't defeat it by positive thinking and self-help. You defeat it by having the Spirit of God in your life. One day at the return of Jesus, the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit will become obsolete. There's no command in the new heavens and the new earth for Christians to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God's presence at that point will be fully given to us with no, no holding back. And this is the second part of chapter 3, verse 9. At that point, so there's a progression. He does not sin, and now he cannot sin. At the moment of conception, with a sperma, with a seed, we begin to sin less and less. When Jesus returns at the fullness of His presence, we, all together, stop sinning. Verse 9, He cannot sin because He has been born of God. The verb cannot only occurs one other time in, in John's letter, and that's in chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother at the same time, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God. The exact same word. The word here is dunama, right? Where we get the word dynamite. It means you don't have the power. Right? Like the meme, I don't have the capacity. Right? You don't have the ability. It's impossible. You cannot love God and hate 
your brother at the same time. That is impossible. In chapter 3, the impossibility is what? Being born again and sinning at the same time. So at conception of our spiritual life, sin begins to die. When Jesus returns, sin altogether will have no heartbeat. It will be dead. Because God will be dwelling with us. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Right? This is the whole Bible in a nutshell. I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will dwell among you. The story of redemption begins in the garden and ends with a garden coming down on earth. God's presence comes down and the whole earth will be the garden of Eden. And I will be your God. You will be my people. And I will dwell. My presence shall be with you. And he will dwell with them. And what happens when God's presence is now with us in full measure? Death, which is the consequence of sin, the wages of sin is death, shall be no more. Neither shall be there, there be mourning, or crying, or pain, For the former things of sin, death, tears, sexual immorality, those things have now passed away with the entrance of God's presence in full measure. As John earlier wrote, as we have seen on that day, we shall be like God. Pure. First John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, already. We are born again now. Yet, and what will be has not yet. So there's already and not yet, right? It's there, but not yet. Not yet appeared. We only have God's presence partially, not fully. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him. Because we shall see Him as He is. And and, and who is God? God is pure in chapter 3. In chapter 1, who is God? God is light. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness. And Paul clarifies, I think, what it means that God is light. It means God is holy. He is righteous. There is no darkness ounce, no scintilla of sin whatsoever in God. So we were once formerly in darkness, once in sin, but now you are in the light in the Lord. Therefore, walk as children of light. That's the journey of the Christian life. It's the book of Genesis chapter 1. What is a Christian life? There is darkness that filled the whole creation. That's like us. Before we came to faith, before we heard the word of truth, darkness and chaos in our lives. And then one day, God said to us, Let there be light. Perhaps you were in your bedroom. Perhaps you were at church. Perhaps you were at Bible study. Somebody came and proclaimed the word of life. And just like Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let there be light. And Paul in 2 Corinthians, takes this, right? Takes this and applies it to the moment of the born-again experience. And there was light. And we saw the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus 
And at that moment, sin began to die. Drunkenness began to die. Self-centeredness began to die. Temper flare-ups began to die. Dishonesty began to die. Lust began to die. So our journey is from darkness into His marvelous light. And one day, darkness will be all gone. And all we will see is light. And that's why the book of Revelation says, the new heavens and the new earth, there's no more sun. There's no sun lighting the earth. Why? Because God will be our light. He will be our light. We cannot sin. It is impossible. So let us now close with the following challenge. The death of sin in our lives began with our new birth in Christ Jesus. The initial stage of this new birth with, shine, with sinning less ends with the final stage. So we have the initial stage of new birth. You sin less. Now you have a final stage of not sinning at all, at all, when Jesus returns. Hence, let us examine, praise Church West Covina, if there's a downward trajectory, a downward trend, if there's a chart of our Christian life, do we see a path from darkness to light? If this is sin, when Pastor Joel first heard the gospel, is there a chart that shows there's a downward trajectory of sin? Because that's what John is saying. The one who is born of God does not sin. Because God's seed abides in him. And indeed, he cannot sin when Jesus returns. And this is the whole point of God. You can't minimize sin. You can't confine sin to a box and say it's only unbelief. No, it's not. It can be the entire story of the Christian life. So your confidence then in your claim to be a Christian should be a spiritual chart. A progress of your obedience. I mean, really sinning less now than a year ago? I mean, really less selfish now than six months ago? Am I really less lustful now than last month? Because if God's seed abides in you, you do not sin. Indeed, you cannot sin. Let us prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper.